In this lab, the front end isn't properly sanitizing carriage return line feeds before rewriting HTTP2 requests to HTTP1.1 to talk to the backend. And I'll show you how you can exploit this behavior to inject JavaScript into a smuggled request via a 302 redirect and have the front end cache the response containing our reflected cross site scripting attack, which will impact any visitor browsing the site for as long as the front end is caching the response to that request that we smuggled in. Let's get started. I'm on the homepage of the lab here, and the first thing we want to do is detect and confirm the CRLF vulnerability. So I'm going to switch to burp and go to proxy and HTTP history. And I'm grabbing the get slash request for the root endpoint here. I'm going to send it to repeater and switch to repeater. I'm also going to dock the inspector window here to the left to make it a bit easier for you to follow along. Now, what I found is if I go to request headers and I go to the original path header here for HTTP2, I couldn't use the lab solution because if I say guess, uh, cache buster equals one for a value of HTTP 1.1, followed by shift enter for a carriage return line feed and add an arbitrary header with a name of foo for a value of bar and hit enter, you can see that uh, burp repeater is removing my carriage return line feeds here. It's uh, stripping them out. And if I send this request, I get an invalid request error. But I was able to work around this. I'm just going to reset this back here to uh, slash for the front page send the request again to make sure I get back at 200 OK. And then in the inspector window, I'm going to go back. And I'm going to scroll down here and add a second path header. So a custom one myself. And I'm going to request a resource that doesn't exist and hit Enter to add it. And then send the request again. And I get a 404 not found now. So that confirms that the second path header that I added myself is, is taking precedence over the original path header here. And if I scroll down and go back to our path header that we added, I'm going to try the same trick here. So HTTP 1.1, add a carriage return line feed, and add a arbitrary header foo for a value of bar, and hit Enter, and then send this request. You can see that we still get a 404 not found. So that means that the this path header is taking precedence over the original one, and we're able to inject a carriage return line feed here. So that confirms the CRLF vulnerability. Now let's try and smuggle in a request. So I'm going to remove the request for the resource that doesn't exist here. Instead, we're requesting the front page, but we're adding a cache buster equals one query parameter, just to make sure that we don't poison the request for the or the response to the, the actual front page. And then underneath here, underneath foo for a value of bar, we're going to add a carriage return line feed to signal the end of the foo uh, request header, and then a second carriage return line feed to signal the end of the request here. And then we can smuggle in a request. So we're smuggling in a request for something that doesn't exist again using HTTP 1.1. And then we want to add a valid host header. So I'm going to go back to proxy and grab the host header here and just copy that. And then go back to repeater and paste that host header. And then I'm going to apply changes and send the request again. And we get a 200 OK. But if I render the page, you can see this is just a uh, request. If I go back to pretty for the actual front page, we don't see anything for our smuggled request that should show a 404 somewhere. And this is because this is a blind request smuggling attack, because we're not able to see the response to our smuggled request for the resource that doesn't exist, since the front end is only reading in the response from the back end up to the content length of the front page. But we can turn this attack into a non-blind attack by switching the request method from get to head. So I'm going to go back here to the left and go to the inspector window and click back. And then for the method here, instead of get, we want head, hit enter, and then send the request again. And you can see that the response has taken a long time to get back. And eventually, we'll get a timeout. And that's because the head request will only request, request headers and not the actual content. And the front end is trying to read in the response from the back end up to the content length of the front page which is likely larger than uh, 8,000 bytes. But our get request for a non-existing resource has a content length that's much smaller. And that's why we're getting this timeout error. And I can show you this if I go back to the lab and then copy the URL for the front page here and switch to the terminal and do a head request for the front page. You can see that the front page has a content length of 8,391 bytes, while the content length of a resource that doesn't exist with a 404 has content length 11. So that's way less than 8,391. So let's try and find a piece of content that has an adequate content length. So I'm switching back to the lab and just viewing the first post and copying the URL. And then do a head request for post ID 5 in this case. And we can see it has a content length of 7,305. That's not enough because we need this content length here. Let's search for post ID 1. 
7713, that's not enough. Post ID 2 has a content length of 9039, which is more than the content length we had for the front page here, 8391. So that's sufficient. So let's go with post ID 2. So I'm going to copy the URI for post ID 2 here, and I'm going to switch to burp. And then in our smuggled request here, under the second path, we are, instead of the requesting the resource that doesn't exist, let's request post ID 2, hit enter to save, and then send the request. And this works, we get back a 200 OK. We can also see the request headers for our smuggled request here. If I render the page, you can see uh, part of the post ID 2 here. So that works. So now let's find a sync that reflects arbitrary input back to us in the response so we can inject JavaScript. So that's the request that we'll smuggle in instead, instead of the request for post ID 2 here. So let's look for a reflection vulnerability. I'm going to go to proxy. And then you can see that there's a few static files that are being requested here from the resources folder. So you can pick any one of them. I'm picking these, this one here, labheader.js, send it to repeater, and switch to repeater. Just going to send this request so we get back a reply or a response for the static asset itself. Now, the interesting behavior by the backend uh, web server is that if you request at the folder level with a terminating slash here, then you get a 404 not found. But if you leave out the terminating slash, you get a 302 redirect to the where the location is back to the folder level with the terminating slash appended. And that's handy for us because that means that part of our input here in the URI path is reflected back to us in the response. Now, normally in a classical cross-site scripting reflection attack, you'd want the input to be reflected in the response body. But in this case, that reflected input can be in the headers because our response headers from our smuggled request will be part of the response body. And you can see that here, if I go back to our previous request and go to pretty, you can see here our smuggled request uh, headers or the response to our smuggled request, those uh, response headers are visible here in the response body. So let's go back to the previous tab. And then here in our attack, we want to make sure that we inject JavaScript into this response. And we know that the sync is our URI path here. So I'm just going to add a query parameter for a value of, and then open the script tags, send an alert equals one, and then close the script tags, and then just send this request. Uh, you can see that it's nicely reflected here, so in our response. So I'm going to copy this entire URI and then go back to the previous tab. And then instead of the post ID 2 here, the get request for that, we're just going to inject the URI path that contains our uh, JavaScript, and then apply changes, and send the request. But you can see the response has taken a long time to get back, and eventually it'll time out again. And that's because we're running into that same timeout issue again that we ran in before, because the response to our smuggled request is smaller than the actual content length of the front page. So let's add some padding. I'm going to switch back to the terminal and open a new window here. And then with Python, let's say Python 3, we want to send the command print. And we're going to repeat the character A 10,000 times. Let's see if we uh, execute this. Yep, that seems good. And let's copy this to the clipboard. There we go. And then switch back to burp. And then go to our, let's test it here first. So I'm just going to append it after here, after the script tags, and paste it. Also going to show new lines because I think, yep, when we paste it, it injected a new line as well. And we do want HTTP2 to be on the same line uh, as our uh, padded A's here, our padded A characters, and our script tags. So I'm just going to go back down here and make sure that we remove that carriage return line feed so that HTTP2 is on the same line. And then send this request. And yeah, we can see our uh, padded A characters are added. And if I select the entire uh, response here, you can see that we have a uh, byte size of over 10,000. So that should be sufficient. So let's go back to the previous tab and append that padding to our uh, smuggled request here. So after we close the script tags, I'm just going to paste the padded A's. And then here at the bottom, again, make sure that that carriage return line feed is removed just so that HTTP 1.1 is on the same line as our padding. And then we can say apply changes and then send the request again. And we get back at, at 200 OK. And we can see that the uh, script tags are uh, injected now. So let's go to the lab. And instead of post ID 5, let's say cache buster equals 1. And we can see, yep, yeah, we get that alert uh, pop up now.
So now instead of poisoning the response uh, by the front end cache for cache buster equals one, let's poison the response to the actual front page without that query parameter. So I'm going to go back to burp and then I'm going to remove cache buster equals one here and then click apply changes and then send a request again. And we get a 200 OK. We get our 302 found here and we get our injection again. So I'm going to go back to the lab and then I'm going to copy this. If I would select the uh, just the front page, we would see um, our cached response that we poisoned. If I select cache buster equals two, uh, we get a, a non-cached version of the front page and we can see that we've solved the lab successfully. I hope this was helpful to you and thank you for watching.